Great, thanks, Dario. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining me here tonight or today for this presentation where I'll be talking about the psychology of everyday computers and how human interaction affects everything that we do. So first thing is that, uh, to introduce myself, my name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer as part of SUSE Labs, which I'm sure that many of you here watching this talk uh, live are also members of SUSE Labs, I hope. Um, and you know, last year it was great to have the opportunity to meet many of you when I got to visit the Czech Republic. But for those of you who I have not met, uh, maybe the reason for that is that I live in Australia. Uh, and because I'm based in Queensland, Australia, this means that it is currently 9 p.m. for me, quite late compared to the time zones most of you are in. So the best way to get in contact with me if you have a question is either via Rocket Chat with my nickname First Year or my email, which is wbrown at suza.de. And as mentioned, for those of you who don't know what I do or who I am, uh, I generally work in my day job on the 389 directory server, which is uh, the LDAP server that SUSE is offering as part of SLE and our pro and uh, OpenSUSE, which we are using to then replace uh, OpenLDAP. So generally, I'm the identity management and LDAP authentication person, and uh, that's that's my special area of the world that I I like to work in. I'm also the creator of the Kanye Yen project, which I spoke about last year. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you today about. Today I'm talking about how we interact with computers. But a slightly close example is uh, Kerberos. Now, here's an example of someone attempting to log in to an account with Kerberos. Now, the account, you, the command you need to use is this here. It's k in it William at example.com. And K in it's a bit of an interesting name. If you didn't know it, that this is how you log in when using Kerberos, then it might be hard to find what this command name is. It means you're initializing your credentials cache. But in this example, we can see that an error occurs. So something is going wrong when we're trying to log into our account. So one of our first things that we might do as a system administrator is we might attempt to get more information about what is occurring on this system. So the first thing we might do is to say add dash V for verbose. But unfortunately for us, this gives us a new error message, which is quite different to our original one, saying no credentials cache file was found. That's very confusing, and it's a bit frustrating for us as the administrator. So we go and look at the uh, man page, and we find that dash V relates to something to do with credential caches and not verbosity. And in fact, the verbose flag is represented by the dash capital V instead. When we pass that argument in, we see that the error message returned is the same as before. We've gained no new information despite asking the program to give us more. OK, so maybe we'll do what we normally do on other things. If you list the flag multiple times, sometimes we get more verbosity, so say dash VV. When we do this, however, we don't get any more information. So at this point, many people would probably be left feeling quite silly or bemused or a bit stumped about what's going on with our simple Kerberos login. Now, for those of you who have encountered this problem, you may be aware of the answer to this. But for most of us, it's actually quite hard to find. Even Google searching doesn't turn up this as an answer. The answer is that there's a nearly undocumented environment variable which you can set called krb5 underscore trace. And I apologize if it's a bit small on your screen. When you set this environment variable to the name of a file, such as slash dev std error, it then writes all of the debugging output onto your standard error output, or say, to a file or something else. And at this point, we now get the output that we need in order to understand that the problem is that we don't have the correct DNS records in our network to complete the login. And this is a bit frustrating. When we're using Kerberos, a lot of people have this idea that Kerberos is a very difficult technology to use, and they often find it frustrating and hard. And you know, commands like this certainly leave people feeling just a little bit silly. So an example that might be a bit more relevant to, say, us as software engineers is something here in C. Now, many of you are very astute, and I hope that some, most of you or some of you have at least already identified the problem with this code. When we're using something in C, 
we're, you know, if we're trying to take a lock, we might use this pthread mutex lock command, or function, sorry. But unfortunately, in this example, I don't actually unlock the lock, which means that predictably, if we were to run this code, it would deadlock. And that's really frustrating. Now, while this was a simple example, and we might all or generally most of us have seen that error uh, within the code, it becomes much harder to find in a larger code base. So for example, this is some of the connection code from 389 directory server. Within this code, if you aren't very intimately familiar with it, looking at this code and using it, you wouldn't know where locking is occurring, which by the way, there are two locks taken throughout this via nested functions. And that can be really frustrating because all of us have ended up in that situation where when writing code, we've created deadlocks or we've accidentally locked a variable or unlocked something at the incorrect time, which has created some kind of CPU or memory consistency problem. And again, you know, even for someone like myself who lives and breathes for working on LDAP systems, I often feel very silly and frustrated when working on, on the project just because, you know, I make these mistakes still, even though I have five years of experience working in this code base. Now, there's something else that in our lives that often when we interact with leaves us feeling frustrated and silly, and that's doors. So who here has gone up to a door and you've put your hand on it and tried to open it and the door didn't move and you looked down and you saw the sign that said push? Put your hands up. All right, for everyone who's not on the, the, uh, on the recording, every person in the room, they just put their hand up. And the reason is that we're all human and we've all made this mistake where we have approached a door and it's just not moved. And the thing is that the people in this room and you know the people who are watching this later, we aren't stupid. None of us are. We are all intelligent humans who are domain experts in our relevant fields. So why, when we approach a door, do we suddenly find ourselves being stumped and confused and feeling a bit silly and helpless that when we look down, we see that awful sign that says, no, you should have pulled. Maybe there's something else going wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with the interaction with the door and the way that we're looking at that interface. So there's an entire field of people who actually study the way that humans interact with the world and how they think about things. And that is psychology. And a, a subsection of psychology is around human interaction and how we interact with the world around us. And of course, these interactions can range from things as simple as a door all the way to systems as complicated as maybe, say, a nuclear power plant control room. So pictured here is the control room of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. Now, Three Mile Island is a bit better known for the disaster that occurred there in 1979. Initially, the disaster was put down to human error, where the operators were insufficiently trained or incapable, and that is what led to the disaster that followed. And so it was later on that a, a researching psychologist was asked to uh, investigate the matter. And the name of that psychologist was Don Norman. And when he uh, helped become part of the investigation, he presented a, a theory that it was not in fact human error and that the humans were at fault. He presented that it was in fact the control room which was at fault. That the control room's human interface was so flawed that the operators, regardless of their training, expertise, and intelligence, were unable to recognize that an incident was even occurring because the layout was so confusing and ambiguous. In this way, the interaction was flawed, just like our doors. Don Norman has since gone on from that time to work at many other technology companies, very famously, including Apple. But he's also written uh, books and texts about human interaction. And you know, within those, obviously, the scope is very broad. But there are a number of general principles which we can apply and 
used to understand the world around us and, of course, build up from there into more complex theories and how interaction works. The six principles that are laid out as some of the basis for how we interact with the world around us as humans and the psychology that is involved is these six concepts of visibility, affordance, consistency, mapping, feedback, and constraint. And I apologize for the English second language. Uh, I will explain what these terms mean literally now. So first, visibility. Humans discover interaction elements of an interface by seeing what is possible to interact with. A button may have a contour around it or a color. The door handle may extend from a surface or perhaps there's some kind of texture. Now, of course, this visibility has to extend to more than just our eyes. For people who may be deaf or blind, there may be things like a sound emitted to help people locate it by audio, or perhaps the surface is raised so that people by touch can sense the location. Many people here, without doubt, have not been to Brisbane, Australia. But regardless of that, I'm sure that you can easily identify the location where the button is to open this train door because of the visual attributes. Affordance. This is visual attributes of a control that give a hint as to how it may work or how you interact with it. For example, a dial turns, a button is pressed, a handle is pulled. We can see this on our microwave here. There's a handle that we can pull. We know that if we turn the knob, we're going to change the time. And if we press the buttons, then an action will occur. And in fact, this level of affordance is why with a microwave, most people do not need a manual in order to operate one. You can go to a friend's house and just use their microwave because it affords the correct way for you to interact with it. This is where our doors break down. Doors often afford the incorrect input. For example, they may have a vertical bar which affords a pull action when the door is pushed, which may be better uh, represented by, say, a metal plate which affords the push action. Consistency. Consistency is that controls that look the same should always behave the same. Two dials both rotate and rotate in the same direction for increasing values rather than, say, one push or one uh, being depressed, or one rotating to the right in order to increase and one rotating to the left to increase. This is inconsistent. Taps are a really good example of consistency. This unmarked tap from a hotel room is still usable by, by, I assume, everyone in this room. Why? Because cold is always on the right and hot is always on the left. And this is, in fact, uh, one of the standards by the International Plumbing Union, which I found out when writing this talk. Mapping. Mapping is the relationship between controls and what it uh, interacts with or what it affects. So, for example, we know that you know, when we turn a door handle, we know that it's going to affect the door. When we turn on a light switch, we know, uh, sorry, I'll switch on a lamp, we know it's going to turn on that lamp. This stove is a very good example of poor mapping. Why? Because the burners are laid out horizontally, but the knobs are vertical. So it's very hard for us to establish the relationship as to which knob controls which burner. And this is what leads to this stove having documentation. You may be able to see it on the video, you may not, but slightly to the right uh, and above and below each knob is a small diagram showing which burner relates to which knob. This documentation is to make up for a design flaw. Whereas if the knobs were laid out in the same mapping, say also horizontally relative to the burners, then we would know without documentation which knob related to which burner. Feedback. When a control is used, an indication that that input has been received. So when uh, you, know, you press a button, an action should occur. So for example, if I turn on a light and the light turns on, that's feedback to know that that has worked. If the light does not turn on, I've either turned the wrong switch or something is wrong with my electricity. An absence of feedback will often leave people feeling confused or frustrated because they don't know what is going wrong with the system. A really good example of poor feedback and how this can cause confusion is, as pictured, 
pedestrian crossing buttons in Australia and New Zealand. These have no feedback to tell you when the button has been pressed, so people often don't know if their input or request to cross the road has been received. So what do people do? They stand there pushing the button over and over in order to make sure that their input is actually registered by the system. And finally, constraint. Constraints are limits on a control or an interface to prevent invalid or unsafe behaviours or states. And this really just helps people understand what are things that do go together and what are things that do not. And an example of good constraints for usability is things like gas and water fittings, which have screw threads in the opposite direction so that you can never connect a gas and a water fi uh, fitting to each other. Or for example, car gear boxes, which do not allow you to select reverse gear when traveling above certain speeds, which of course would be highly unsafe. Now, computers are also systems we interact with. All of my examples have generally been about the physical world, but computers are things that we interact with daily, and so much of the world does as well. All of these principles apply to how we interact with our computers. Apple, Microsoft, KDE, Android, all of these publish and provide human interface guidelines, which help us understand and uh, design applications that adhere to a set to hear these rules, but also much more. These human interface guidelines have been hopefully and generally designed with these psychology elements and, as mentioned, much more in order to make sure that applications have a consistent and uh, intuitive user experience. But also there's a lot of accessibility features which get enabled that you may not know about as a result of adhering to the human interface guidelines in a system. So to explain some of these, let's go through this screenshot of Apple's Xcode to explain how some of those elements we've just talked about are relevant here. So one of the first things is that we have feedback when we select a menu. The menu item goes blue and the menu drops down and appears. And by using the Apple native menus, which go in that top bar across, across the top of the um, screen, this allows things like screen readers to actually interrogate the currently running application to present the options available to someone who may be visually impaired. It also allows things like Apple Script to uh, interact with and aut run automated tasks against these menu items without needing a more complicated programming language or API. These menus have consistent items. The items in this menu are not changing based on what is uh, currently valid. Why? Because there are constraints that show you what is possible and what is not. So these items at the top here are grayed out to show they're inactive based on the current constraints that we aren't in a debugging session. Whereas the items in black are currently available for input because they are valid in this context. So that means our menus, we're always going to have a muscle memory towards being able to click them because they're staying the same. These items also list next to them the keyboard shortcuts, and this gives visibility. And so that we can um, find uh, what these shortcuts are so that we can later use them in the future. And this is really good for us as power users because once we are able to visibly find this shortcut, we can then use it in the future to accelerate and speed up our work. We can also see here that mouse interaction elements such as these buttons are very visually distinct and afford a clicking input as compared to say the typing area here, which is white and has text on it, which affords that we are going to type in this area rather than use the mouse to interact with this space. And this is a really good example of how these principles, often when we think of the term design or accessibility, our, uh, our minds may jump immediately to topics like, oh, we're helping out people who may be blind or deaf, or maybe uh, we're, we're thinking of design as in, okay, we're gonna put some pretty colors here and some pretty colors there and, and make it sparkle. But that's not what design is about. As shown with Xcode, Xcode is an application which is designed for software engineers who, like us, are subject matter experts in our domain. We are power users. We are intelligent people who are trying to do complex tasks. And the same way, you know, these design elements help 
us make our jobs easier. And a real kind of testament to the power of what good design and human interaction can achieve is aviation. Uh, cockpits in airplanes are very carefully designed with an understanding of human psychology in mind. And even though pilots are highly trained individuals and they're highly experienced humans, they still have cockpits designed in a way that help them to understand and process the inputs coming in from the plane and then give out actions and give inputs to that machine in order to fly it correctly and safely. And this is one of those things that's really interesting is that design is not just about those accessibility needs, it's about making it so that you know highly trained experts are more effective, more consistent and safer in what we are able to achieve. And as mentioned, it's an absolute testament to this kind of attention to detail and human interaction that every day thousands of people are able to get on board of an airplane and safely fly despite the absolutely amazing level of complexity and physics and risk within these that they are so safe because of all of these elements and more. But we as power users should already be aware of design elements like this and how they help us. A really good example of these of this is things like tab completion. Tab completion as a design element really helps us every day because it not only shows us visibly what are the valid options uh, to that can be completed from here, but it shows us current constraints within the system. So for example, we know that when we're tab completing with a partially completed file name here, the only the listed files are valid completion, which is the current constraints. This is a really good design aspect that helps us every day as power users. So let's go back to our examples before. So we were talking earlier about KUnit. So what were the design failings? What were the psychology principles that KUnit failed at? Why was it that we were unable to easily solve uh, the problems that we were having? And why did we feel frustrated? So one of the first things we might do and that comes to mind when we see something like KUnit, and when I brought up the KLB5 trace variable that showed us the information we needed, one of the first things we might reach for is to document that value within the man page. As listed here, we can see that the current man page for KUnit does not list KLB5 underscore trace as an environment variable. But documentation here is the wrong answer. This is what we have with doors. As we've already mentioned, they have the push-pull documentation to make up for their poor affordance. So by putting in KLB5 trace into the man page here, this isn't actually going to fix the design failings of the command. We're just trying to document our way out of the design failings of that interface. Could we make small changes to KUnit to fix this? Not really. The problem is a little bit more than just a couple of tweaks here and there. We really need to think about how that interface, how that interaction is, should be different. If I lived in a perfect world, I would simply rewrite this interface. Unfortunately, I don't live in that perfect world. But if I was going to rewrite the Kerberos command, what would I make it look like in order to have a better experience? So here is my example of a hypothetical replacement to the KUnit command. One of the first things is that I'd rename it to krb underscore login. The reason for this is that krb is a really well understood and known uh, shortening of Kerberos. And so that is how you know we can use krb underscore and then tab complete to find what are the possible Kerberos commands that may exist on my system that I can then interact with, as opposed to say if I use if I have k and then type, I might get K, K, uh, KDE applications instead or kernel re related entities. So this already gives us a way to help with tab completion to generate constraints. I'd also rename it from init to login. Although the action underneath may be a Kerberos credential cache initialization, a lot of users may not know that this is the interaction occurring. So having a more descriptive and clear name helps to visit, make it more visible as to what the command is doing and how someone should interact with it. One of the next things I would also do is I'd improve the feedback. 
one of the things that can be really useful is to give suggestions about what might be going wrong within the system rather than just say the very technical elements. So here we have an example of the feedback where we say this may be from a missing Kerberos5.conf or incorrect DNS records. Already, just from these two changes, we've already made it so that we can actually potentially resolve the problem we were having with our Kerberos command before just by some small tweaks to these elements. But the next thing I would change is that I would make it so that verbose matches dash lowercase v. And the reason for this is that it becomes consistent with most other command line applications, which also use a lowercase v for verbosity. By making it consistent, this means that administrators who have worked with other commands will instantly know, without needing to look at the man page, how to get more information about their problem. And that's going to help people feel empowered because they don't need to be continually reading documentation to understand how to interact with the system that they're working with. And of course, one of the other changes I would make is that dash VV would then give the equivalent output to our Kerberos 5 underscore trace environment variable. I would eliminate the cowb 5 trace environment variable because this is not visible. It can't be easily found. We have to document our way out of it. So removing that and making it so that dash VV works instantly gives us more accessibility and makes it much easier for administrators to find uh, or to use these options and these features that we write in so that they can then solve their problems. Already, just with these couple of changes, the Kerberos command is now looking significantly better than it was before. And you know, we've actually just fixed a lot of the problems that people have when actually interacting with Kerberos. So let's talk about our C code now. Just like our commands, programming as well is a human interface that we are interacting with. And you know, when we are dealing with this, we have to think about it in the same way. What is the code communicating to us? How is it communicating to us as a human? And am I writing it in a way that also communicates with other people? So in our example, there's poor there's poor, uh, sorry, there is a lack of constraint around the use of the mutex. And those by lacking constraints, we are then able to put the program into invalid states. Now, it's very hard to fix this with something like C. However, other languages are attempting to fix this problem. And I'm going to sound like the biggest shill here because I'm, I'm always on this bandwagon, but Rust does fix this problem. Rust fixes two aspects to do with mutexes and how we interact with them. The first is that it embeds the content that is protected within the mutex. So this helps us establish the mapping relationship between what the lock protects and the act of locking it, unlike C, where the lock and the data it protects are often in disparate areas. By having these two things together, it means that we always know what the lock does and what it relates to and when we need to take it. The second thing is that when we take the lock, we are given back this guard item. The only way we can access the data within the lock is to then interact with the guard once we've acquired it. And when the guard goes out of scope, the lock is unlocked. This gives us a constraint on the lifetime or the length of time that the lock can be held. But it also helps us because it means that if we don't unlock, manually, then it will already be unlocked when we uh, continue. And of course, there's other things that can be done here as well. If we require that a lock, a certain lock with certain set of data is held before entering a function, we can require that in the type signature that says that we take a mutex guard rather than just the uh, unlocked lock, which would be a mutex with the type instead. And so this already means that we have code where we don't have to think as much about deadlocks. And as programmers, the language is actively helping us in order to write more, to write code more effectively. And that means that we as programmers can spend more time solving problems rather than debugging problems of our own creation. So now I want to talk about some other areas of good design that exist within open source and some other examples you may have encountered and how you might want to think about them. Now, I think that the system D in its system component is actually a really great example of uh, good design. 
And, and I think that there's a lot of things that systemd has done really well for init systems and service management on Linux. And one of them is the way that this systemctl command works, is that you can replace the word status here with restart or start or edit or whatever. And you uh, are then able to know that whenever you change that term, it will be consistent that you know you can just with that service just change that one term and then keep interacting with that service. It becomes a very consistent command to use. Similarly, you know that when we just change this dot service at the end to any other service, we know that the status command will continue to work because it will work with everything. In the same way, systemd also makes visible a lot of very advanced concepts. So for example, here it's very clearly making it known to us that there is a drop-in file which is affecting the way that our service is started up. But beyond just that, systemd also makes it very easy to actually consume things like memory limits or cgroup limits, disk IO limits, uh, temporary users, private home, private temp, all of these things. And it makes very advanced concepts which would have been difficult to use with something like upstart or systemd init very accessible and easy to use for us both as packages and also system administrators who are then consuming the products that we work on. Another example is um, of really good design is ZFS. Now, when ZFS was created by Sun, they set out with the mission and one of their, their key values of the file system, there were two key values in it. One was that your data will always be safe. So your data will always be consistent and correct. And number two was that they wanted to make advanced storage concepts accessible to every administrator. And that's a really key thing there because I've previously been a system administrator. I used to work in data centers for a university. And when you were managing those environments where you had huge stands or um, you know things like that, the amount of knowledge you had to have about storage to achieve complex things was quite high. ZFS, however, made it very easy in order to access these things. So for example, here in this screenshot, with no other tools than what is provided, we can see the number of IOPS, both for reads and writes across every single disk within the pool. We can see the read bandwidth. We can see the amount allocated to each disk so we know which ones may or may not have you know, different loadings within the pool. And even beyond that, things like you know, if you want to add in tiered storage, such as having a flash-based read cache, ZFS makes it very easy to actually add this in compared to, say, other file systems or other, other uh, tools. So for, with a proprietary SAN, you would be paying a large number of zeros in order to have this, whereas ZFS makes it quite cheap. Something else that ZFS does is by changing the way that it uh, manages file systems to the mount points, it means that the file system hierarchy is an administration hierarchy disconnected from the mount hierarchy. And that means that you can lay out your file systems in a way that makes sense to you as the administrator for recursive property application that may be separate from the way that you mount those on your actual system. And of course, that encourages you to have a very large number of file systems with those properties that would be quickly inherited but also opinionated choices like having things like snapshots as read only. Those constraints, by having snapshots as read only and they're always mounted within the file system where the snapshot is taken, that also helps administrators by having that constraint to exist. Because it means that first, snapshots are safe from a user accidentally deleting them, which means that you can very safely expose these via things like you know, versions uh, in uh, Samba or um, how they get consumed in Windows and things like that. And you can very safely expose these, but also you know exactly where they're going to be when you take the snapshot. You don't need to go hunt around looking for what snapshot relates to what. You get that nice mapping relationship and you know where it is. If you wanna make it writable, you can just take that snapshot and clone it into a new file system. So these examples, I hope, help you think a bit more about the interactions that you have with the system that you're on. And the thing is that when we're using our computers, when we are interacting with them, and you feel yourself thinking, wow, I'm really frustrated 
by this in, by this interface. I really find this command line tool hard to use. I really find it difficult. Stop and ask yourself, okay, what is the interface? What is the psychology occurring right now? What is it? What is it happening that's causing you to feel frustration? What? How is that tool communicating with you in a way that's causing this frustration to occur? And often we see this with bug reports. For example, a user might report that an LDAP tool is difficult to use, or that they may have accidentally deleted something, for example. And my first response isn't that that is human error. My first response is, how did the tool miscommunicate and allow the person to take an action that they did not intend in the first place? So we should always be asking ourselves, how can we improve that interface? Where was that interface miscommunicating with our humans and our users? Because at the end of the day, when we're writing software, we're writing software not just for ourselves, but we're writing software for our um, customers. And those customers are just like us. They are system administrators. They are domain experts in their own fields. But they're also intelligent and distracted people. And they also need these design elements to exist so they know how to interact with our tools. And the better we make these interfaces, the more advanced things that will empower our users to be able to achieve with the software we create. And that's ultimately what design is about. It's about the respect that we have for the users of our software and about empowering the people who use our software to achieve more than they're able to do on their own. So thank you for listening to me. And I hope that you've enjoyed this. And I still have about 10 minutes for questions. I hope there are some. Uh, I can see a couple of comments at the moment in the uh, um, uh, chat at the moment around guards and, and all of that. Uh, Rust doesn't prevent deadlocking. You can still deadlock in Rust, but it makes it much harder to do it. You have to really try in order to achieve it. And so, you know, it can help you in prevent like trivial issues that you can very easily create in C, but it doesn't solve all problems. It just moves the bar further down the road. It moves the bar so that we can be um, more confident in what we're writing and more expressive in how the interface is telling us what we need to do. So for example, a function, as mentioned, can say, OK, you need this mutex guard. And that requirement means you must hold this lock. Whereas in C, we would document, oh, you need to be holding this lock before you call this function. And that's the kind of example where it becomes better. It's not about fixing everything. It's just about shifting that bar to be a bit higher. So anyway, uh, if there are any other questions, please turn on your webcam and or microphone and I'd love to hear them. Silence, that's scary. Hi, William. Uh, this Hi. is Giovanni. Thank you for the talk. It was a, a very interesting talk. I wanted your comment on um, uh, the old joke that Ken Thompson, one of the, I believe, author of C or Unix, mm -hmm. if he had a car, this car would have only one indicator, one light. <laughs> and if the light is on, then there would be a problem in the car and Ken would know what the problem is without any further need for <laughs> displays and so on, because he knew the system so intimately. Yeah. And um, so the, the I want you to comment on systems that are for experts and needs to get out of the way. And uh, experts yeah. are expected to know intimately how the system work and uh, um, for example, Linus Torvalds uh, would, uh, in a famous email, uh, said that he doesn't like uh, encouraging development of uh, kernel debuggers because people would think less. So he just want you to. I don't really so agree with that because you know, one of the things that I have to deal with every day is people using LDAP servers, and the thing is that people who run LDAP servers tend to be experts in running LDAP servers. They are you know, just like any other database product. You need to be uh, very, uh, not very experienced, but at least experienced and understanding of the subject area. But at the same time, 
These administrators also aren't the developers of those systems. They don't know how, for example, the query optimization engine or the query application engine may work within the LDAP server. They don't know the order in which plugins get called or the way in which virtual attributes are generated inside of memory and how those cache algorithms work. But they also may not know, for example, all the ins and outs of access controls. And so my job as you know, someone who is writing the LDAP server is not only about taking these features which we've spent a lot of time working on and exposing them in a way that these administrators can still use them, but also making it so that when they do have a problem, that it communicates with them in a way that they can then resolve the problem. And that might mean, for example, like you just said about the, the Ken Thompson one indicator light, that might be all well and good for me to know what the indicator light is or what that error message is in the LDAP server log when something goes wrong. But when the administrator doesn't know what that light means, they're going to raise a bug report. And that bug report is going to go through our L1, 2, and 3 support staff. And if none of them understand what that light means, it's going to come to me. And that means more work for me. And so it's much better if in that situation I can help the administrator, or at the very least, help our L1, 2, and 3 support staff understand better what is going on. By having those error messages that can give more feedback around what is occurring and actionable feedback so that they can then take that and do something with it, this helps administrators actually then go, oh, great, I've just had this error occur. I know exactly what to do now. I know that I need to go look up this topic or I need to go and restart this or I need to modify this. It takes a lot of, it's about taking our knowledge and our subject domain expertise and putting that into an interface in a way that other people can then consume and take advantage of. So one of the best things I ever wrote for accessibility in uh, 389 is I wrote a automatic database tuning system where it'll look at your current system hardware and work out what your cache requirements, CPU requirements are, and it can adjust those as requirements change. And before that, people had to manually tune their database. Whereas after that, the automatic tuning was so good that we, at the time I was working for Red Hat, not SUSE, but at the time we had more than 50% drop in L1 and 2 case calls for database tuning. We basically halved our incoming caseload just by making a feature that made something more accessible and in fact made a whole class of problems go away. We've also received a large amount of feedback about how good our command line tools are as a result of having reworked them to keep in mind these things and really communicate what's going on. So when people are using and looking at our error messages, they get clear feedback around what they need to do if something goes wrong or why their commands went wrong. And so it's not about making it so that, you know, it's not like saying that there's, this makes it so that stupid people can use LDAP isn't the answer here. It's not about that. That's, having, that's disrespectful to our users. It's about having users who have a different set of experiences and a different set of expertise and empowering them so that they can do things without needing my set of expertise. And that's really what it comes down to. And that's what I want to embed in my work when, when I'm uh, programming. And what I hope you know, people are able to then take into their own work by applying these concepts in, in their own interfaces. Hi. Uh, so how did this culture of, you know, uh, paying attention to affordances, basically paying attention to the psychology of making usable software, how did this thing uh, get to grow in Red Hat and how can we do something similar at SUSE so that our tools and our offerings in the future have that essentially fe features that is there usable to the users? So how it, uh, it wasn't really a thing that was at Red Hat. Uh, it was specific to 3819, and it was actually introduced by me. And that was actually as a result of um, someone I know here in Brisbane. Her name is Sherelle Collette. And she was, in fact, the one who introduced me to this. And I have another friend who is uh, studying psychology who has helped me further from there. And that helped me bring that into the 389 team. And that uh, is something that I've brought along, you know, when I've come over to SUSE. So... Uh, how we bring this into SUSE is I think that it's something that uh, 
generally it's like any any change it's like anything in our in our work especially with us as software engineers is that it takes someone to within a software project to champion that and to put in the hard work in order to make these changes so for example for 389 that was probably myself and then now that's flowed into the rest of the team and that's been really great to see so for example for other projects it may require someone who say watch this talk to then go oh now i'm going to think about this when i'm doing my work but i think that if you know if we organizationally wanted to do this more we would probably need some uh ux specialists who probably were across domain in a few things probably a bit of psych a bit of programming and stuff like that and also just a willingness from our other software teams to make these changes because one of the things that is often hard with these interfaces is that we do need to change how user interfaces and that user experience is going to look. And sometimes we can be very hesitant to change what a command line tool's options might be, for example, because we're risking breaking compatibility. And so that can be a very difficult um, topic or change to actually make to improve that. And we have to weigh up the benefit of making that change. For 389, it was a much easier proposition. We had to remove Perl. And so we were already in a position to require a rewrite of our command line and administration tools from Perl to Python. So we were already in that process. And we were able to make that change over the course of three years. <laughs> so you know, it is one of those things that is, is there for the long haul. It's not a quick change. Um, but certainly, uh, I'm very happy to, at the very least, I'm happy to uh, help out and answer questions. And maybe we can make a working group or something like that where we can actually then submit these ideas and go from there um, in order to help facilitate and improve the awareness about these topics with, uh, within the organization. So thank you for your very good question. Okay, and uh, it's about time to end the session and prepare for the next one, I guess. So thank you again, William. Very interesting no, talk. No, thank, thank you everyone for being here and listening. Uh, and I really appreciate all of your time and, and attention. So I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>